Hello everyone, this is Bhavik Choksi over here and I hope you guys are doing great. So in today's video, we will be doing a full chart based revision for valuation of securities uh, in your CA final SFM. We would be discussing uh, all these securities which can be bonds, shares, convertibles, right instruments, money market instruments and all around it. So this is a very important topic and I would definitely put uh, a tier 1 category weightage over here around 15 marks almost certain to come from this section. Uh, one can always subdivide and treat let's say bonds as we are going to start with uh, as a separate section and shares as separate but we are discussing everything under one umbrella so you get everything at one place. So we'll start with bonds. Now what are bonds, debentures or other fixed income securities? Now these are instruments which are going to give you a fixed return maybe in the form of coupon which is also called as interest and the re return of the principal which is the redemption value. Now if I were to do valuation how will I value a fixed income securities? How will I value a bond? Well the valuation of any asset in the world of finance is done by taking the present value of the future cash flows. So what are the future cash flows that I'm going to get from a bond? Well I'm going to get interest and I'm going to get the principal value back. So over here if there's a bond of five years and every year it is going to give me let us say 99% uh, uh, coupon so 1000 rupee bond gives me 9% coupon so that is 90 rupees in year 1, 90 rupees in year 2, 90 rupees in year 3, 90 rupees in year 4 and then 90 plus let us say the principal value back 1090 in year 5. So in practice valuation of bonds is inherently more easier than the valuation of shares because the cash flows are fairly certain and as a result if I were to find the value of the bond today I have to find out the cash flows that I am going to receive from this instrument and then discount it to today's value because I am going to pay the price today. So what should be the discount factor? Well the discount factor should be the minimum required rate of return that an investor expects to receive in the next best alternative bond. There is no point comparing it with the cost of equity or the weighted average cost of capital because they have inherently a higher risk and as a result the discount factor over here should be very similar to the cost of debt that is a minimum required rate of return that an investor expects to get from a similar investment in a similar bond with a similar credit rating. So that is how your valuation of bonds will proceed where you are going to take the present value of all the future interest and the redemption value at the end. Now it is not necessary that the redemption should happen at the end only. This is what you call as a bullet bond. There can also be a bond which is an amortizing bond where you're going to get the principal value back in, uh, uh, in each of the years. So we are not going to bother about what is revenue in nature, what is capital in nature as long as you're going to get the cash flows. Well you take this into the working. So you will take the interest as well as the redemption values as and when you're going to receive and try to find the value of the bond as a present value. So that is for a regular bond where the present value of future cash flows will be the value of the bond. Now there can be a few variations of this standard category of bond. Most likely there can be something like a semi-annual bond. So unless given otherwise we always assume that the cash flows are going to be received on an annual basis. Now is it necessary that interest is received each year? No. It is possible that interest can be received every six months can also be received every three months uh, in case of quarterly or every one month as well. So if interest is received in every six months semi-annually then how will the valuation happen? Well if the bond has a coupon of 9% and let us say if uh, the market rate of interest is 10% and the term for example is five years in a regular bond you can take 1990 coupon in each of the years. However if the coupon comes semi-annually that means you're not going to get 90 at the end of the first year in fact you're going to get 45 rupees at the end of six months and then another 45 at the end of another six months and so on. So over here you will divide this by two so that is 4.5 percent for six months but then the required rate of return should also be divided by two so that is five percent for six months. However in five years you have 10 half years and as a result you'll multiply this by two so you have 10 half years and now you can solve. Now this rule is not just for semi-annual it can be for any bond which is other than annual. So for example if the bond is quarterly then instead of dividing by 2 and multiplying by 2 you will divide it by 4 multiplied by 4. So the working over here will be the same as a regular bond except that the coupon rate will be divided by m the discount rate will also be divided by m m over here refers to the frequency in a year so in a semi-annual bond the frequency is two times and uh, you multiply by m so m over here will refer to the frequency 
per annum that you are going to receive the cash flows so simple as that and in case of a perpetual bond so a perpetual bond is relatively rare but if it comes remember this bond is very similar to an equity share equity share also has perpetuity and as a result the valuation of this bond should be very similar to the valuation of an equity share and the valuation of equity share is done using the gordon's formula where we say that the price is d1 upon ke minus g because it is a share in case of a bond instead of dividend we say that we will receive the interest instead of ke we will have the kd that is the cost of debt and the growth over here will be zero percent dividend grows interest remains the same and hence the formula over here will be interest upon the cost of debt or even the cost of preference shares if you're trying to value a perpetual preference share the growth is zero percent yes one can say that in india perpetual preference shares are difficult we don't we are not solving a law paper we are solving an fm paper if it comes you solve don't give your legal gyan there okay now uh, a couple of things uh, which are fairly interesting and also important would be the relationship before we proceed the relationship between the coupon rate and the market rate of interest also called as a discount rate if the coupon rate is greater now this is a fairly valuable bond in which case for cross checking you should remember that this is a bond typically whose market price should be greater than the face value because it is a premium bond it is giving you more coupon the rate at which you are going to receive the money is greater than the rate which you use for discounting similarly if there is a bond where the coupon rate is less than the discount rate then this is an inferior bond the bond is we require let us say 10 percent return the bond is giving us only four percent and hence this bond will typically trade at a premium the market price will be lower typically than the face value these two are good to know concepts if you are aware you can use that for cross checking but the third one is an absolute important one you have to remember this where coupon rate equals a discount rate so in cases where coupon rate equals for example the discount rate the market price is set to equal the face value and sir why would that be well because if you require 10 percent and the bond also gives you 10 percent so you're compounding something by 10 percent that is a coupon and you're discounting it back <coughs> Also by 10% so if it's a 100 rupee instrument, you should be paying 100 rupees for that. And hence the market price is equal to face value. Sir, why is this the most important category? Well, because in a lot of questions that you see in the study material as well as in the RTBs and exams, Institute has said that a bond uh, whose face value is 100 rupees and is trading at par is having a coupon of 10%. Okay. If the bond is having a face value of 100 and is trading at par, that is the market price and the face value are the same, then you have to figure out that the coupon rate and discount rate or the market rate of interest are also the same. So in such questions, uh, the institute sometimes tells you that, okay, the market rate of interest now changes by 2%. You should be aware that the market rate of interest to start with is the same as the coupon rate because the bond change is at par. So this is something that you should be aware of. Okay then you go to the next concept of bond first was a bond evaluation now is a bond return measurement so when we are looking at the return measurements for bond there are two broad measures one is the yield and second is the forward rates what do you mean by yield yield is the return that you are actually generating on the bond now there are three measures of yield the current yield the realized yield as well as uh, the yield to maturity in my opinion the most important measure of yield is the yield to maturity but nevertheless what do you mean by current yield and how do you calculate it well the current yield is calculated as interest divided by the market price so whatever is the interest divided by the market price will give you the current yield now this method ignores time value it ignores capital appreciation and hence it is not as frequently used unless the question specifically asks you to calculate so in order to get that into consideration comes realized yield so when you're trying to find the realized yield what this method does is it takes the total of all the cash inflows that are received by the bond at the end of the life of the bond so over here if it's a five-year bond of a standard example who has a nine percent coupon then actually 90 90 90 rupees are received in each of the years but the realized yield method would say that okay a total of uh, if i total all of these one four five zero will be received at the end of the fifth year and how much am i investing today for example let's say 960 then what is the return 960 today becomes 1450 after five years then using the compound interest formula we can say 1450 equals 960 into 1 plus r raised to 5 and you can find the return now this method kind of considers a capital appreciation 
but does not really truly factor in the time value because 90 rupees received in the first year is not equivalent to 90 received in the fifth year. Here we are clubbing everything together and taking at the end. So that is not the best way to do unless a question specifically asks you. And then comes the most beloved measure of yield for the market, which is a yield to maturity. What do you mean by yield to maturity? This refers to the return that an investor generates if he were to buy the bond today at the prevailing price and hold the bond up to maturity. In which case, how will you calculate it? Well, the best way to calculate the yield to maturity will be using the IRR technique, internal rate of return technique that is using trial and error by using interpolation. So in the exam, if possible, try to use the IRR technique. But if you're out of time and you, I mean, you unfortunately don't know how to apply the trial and error method, then an approximate shortcut method is available, though it is le less preferred as compared to the IRR technique, whereby you can take the approximate measure as interest plus RV minus MB, that is a capital appreciation divided by N. So that's roughly the capital appreciation per annum upon RV plus MP by two, that is the average investment this will give you the approximate return though ideally we should try to calculate using the trial and error method if nothing is given and the question asks you to calculate yield i would go and calculate the yield to maturity now there is another concept called as forward rates which is used extensively in the chapter on interest rate management as well what do you mean by forward rates forward rates refer to the rates prevailing in a future year it's not the average rate, it is a rate prevailing in a future year. For example, if a two-year bond or a two-year fixed deposit gives you 12% per annum, whereas a one-year fixed deposit gives you 10% per annum, and someone asks you that what is the rate of interest in the second year? This is what the forward rate means. So for example, we would say that, well, if I start with one rupee now, at the end of two years, I should be at the same position. I either take a two year fixed deposit in which case one divided by 0 0.12 raised to two or I invest in a one year fixed deposit and then roll over for another year at the second year's prevailing rate. The one year fixed deposit will come at 10%. Second year's rate we don't know but the bank today is quoting me 12% for both the years and as a result what one can say is both of these have to be equal otherwise there will be arbitrage possibilities and therefore if we solve this will give you let's say 1.2544 if I remember this correctly equals 1.1 into 1 plus r2 and if i were to solve this then r2 will come to approximately 14.04 or something uh, i mean please uh, forgive me if there is some error in this calculation it's approximately 14 percent as far as i remember i mean i'm not sitting with the calculator right now so that uh, time can be better managed but nevertheless so this 14.04 percent would refer to the return of the second year Okay, the average return over two years is 12%, but the return in the first year is 10, the return in the second year is 14. This really helps us in our interest rate management when we have to uh, look at forward rates, etc. So over here, these are the actual rates expected to prevail in an individual year in the future. So uh, in bond return, I would treat yield to maturity to be the most important in this section. Achha, now you have understood probably bond valuation, then bond return. You need to do some practice, right? Uh, this is just a quick revision of these concepts. Now you go to bond risk. How do you figure out which of the bonds are more risky? For example, when we look at equity shares, if you remember in portfolio, there is something called as beta. And beta measures the sensitivity, volatility of a share's movement vis-a-vis -vis the overall market movement. So higher the beta, higher is the risk of a share, lower the beta, lower is the risk of a share. But in case of bonds, which is that measure? Well, which are the three ingredients which define a bond? First is the maturity, how long in years. Second is the coupon rate. Uh, and third is the discount rate the yield or the discount rate or the market rate of interest these are the three factors which define a bond typically if i were to ask you between a five-year bond and a 20-year bond which is more risky we would say uh, sir a 20-year bond because it has a larger period of uncertainty similarly if i were to ask you a bond which gives you a zero coupon versus a bond which gives you a 10 percent coupon which of the two is more risky one would say well again a zero coupon bond because uh, it does not give me any coupon so I have to wait till the end. I can't recover any part of my investment before that as opposed to a coupon bond where at least I can recover a part of my investment before the end and so on. 
so we can't just look at only the maturity only the coupon or only the discounted we have to look at a number which takes all the three into consideration and hence comes a concept of duration there are two types of durations first being the macquelays duration which is the most important it is a gold standard for bonds in practice if you are going to go into a fixed income manager's uh, office for an interview you are almost certainly going to be asked about macquelays duration it is as important and as extensively used in practice so over here when we are looking at a macquelays duration what do we mean by macquelays duration well macquelays duration is calculated <coughs> loosely speaking as a time based weighted average it says that okay if it's a five year bond our standard five year bond which is one two three four five coupon of 90 90 90 90 and 1090 and let us say a discount factor is 10 percent so this is 0 0.9091 uh, 0 0 0.8264 0 0.7513 0 0.6830 0 0.6209 and so on so I can find the present value of all of these and find the value of the bond. However, what I want to do is I want to find the duration. So uh, this method tells you mathematically to find the time based weighted average. So over here, this is T into PV of cash flows. That is 1 into 90 into 0 0.909. Ek number aega. Vaise paanch alag number aega. And you will total them up. I'm not doing into the calculations now. I'm just broadly explaining. So this will give you T into the PV of cash flow. So this is a cash flow <coughs> and this is a discount rate. So that will give you the numerator of the McWellis duration. T is the number of years. PVCI is nothing but the cash flow into uh, the discount factor. Okay. But it is a time based weighted average. And if I look at the weighted average, the formula is always summation weight into x upon summation of all weights so over here it is a duration so time is the base and the weights are the present value of cash flows so you will divide this by the present value of all cash flows in order to find uh, what you call as macwellis duration if you have practiced duration and I, I again repeat this is not a lecture where i teach you how to calculate duration i'm just revising on how duration can be calculated but a lot of students face a challenge in understanding and interpreting what the duration actually stands for. Duration in the most reasonable and lame, layman's terms would mean something which is very very similar to average due date. If you remember in your CA foundation or in your intermediate, I'm not sure, you must have studied a concept of average due date if I'm not wrong. And what is average due date? Average due date is if you have money which is going to be received from a particular customer or you have to pay to a particular supplier on various dates, various different amounts of money. If instead of paying all of these amounts at different different dates, if a single amount is to be paid at a single date, which date would that be? Well, that was the average due date. Macwellis duration is doing exactly the same thing. So if it's a five year bond and if I do this working and let's say the, du uh, the duration comes to around 3.63 or 4 point something, let us say, <coughs> if it comes to 4.1, it means that rather than making a payment of 90, 90, 90, 90, 90 and 1090, if I have to make a single payment on a single date, which date would that be? Well, that date would be 4.1 years ago. And if you're aware of the concept of average due date read with the payback period if you have studied that in capital budgeting what does payback period teach you it tells you that payback period the shorter the better the earlier you recover the money back the better it is and as a result over here the shorter the duration the lesser is the risk duration takes all the three core factors of the bond into consideration it takes the time it takes uh, the coupons and the cash flows and it also takes the discount factors considering all the three it finds a metric where the faster you recover money the shorter the payback period the lesser is the risk and lesser is the risk lesser will be the volatility and hence the macwellis duration is a gold standard for measuring the risk in case of a bond however if we want to figure out that uh, how does a bond respond to a particular change in a bond typically which is that item which changes uh, sir, does the maturity largely change? No. If it's a 10 year bond, it is a 10 year bond. Coupon in almost all cases, I mean, uh, floating rate bonds kept aside in almost all other cases, that is the fixed rate bonds that come in your uh, exam, the coupon is also the same. 
However, can the market rate of interest change? Of course, the market rate of interest can change if the RBI changes, the Federal Reserve changes. If these bodies change the rate of interest, the market rate of interest can undergo a change. And if the market rate of interest go, undergoes a change, your bonds price should also undergo a change. Like in equities, if the Sensex Nifty changes, your share price will also ideally change in a similar way here the market rate of interest if that undergoes a change your bonds price should also change the question is by how much will it change and that is what duration helps us calculating however the number mac value duration does not really give you the exact quantum of that change and hence there is a slight modification because there's a relationship between the duration and the discount rate uh, we kind of adjust the formula a little which is called as modified duration also called as volatility so over here modified duration or also called as volatility over here refers to the quantum of the expected change in a bond's price in response to a 1% change in the market interest rate. You have to remember that the bond's price and the market interest rate are always inversely related. That is, if the market interest rate increases, the bond price will fall. If the market interest rate reduces, the bond price will rise. You can try verifying that it is always going to happen. So if there's an increase in the interest rate, which is uh, what people are discussing today in uh, uh, today's economic terms, inflation is rising. So market interest rate will also change. Bond prices are expected to go down. And if market interest rate falls, the bond prices are expected to rise. But the question is by how much will they rise? Like in case of equity shares, if the beta is two times, they're expected to rise two times that of the market. Whether the, and if the beta is 0.5, then it, they're expected to rise half as compared to that of the market. So here, how much will they change? Well, that is measured by modified duration. And modified duration is a McWillis duration upon the existing discount rate or existing YTM. So if 4.1 years is the McWillis duration and 10% is the existing discount rate, then uh, for example, 3.6 or something will be the modified duration, which means that if you're expecting the market interest rate to go up by 1%, your bond will go down in price by 3.6%. And if you sit and verify, so for example, if you actually take 11% as a discount factor and you verify it, you'll get, you'll see that the answer is almost the same, though not exactly the same, but almost the same. <coughs> so this helps us in measuring <coughs> the sensitivity of a bond's price in response to changes in the market rate of interest. Now, as we said that duration helps us in almost accurately predicting the change in price. It does not exactly predict the exact change in price because there is something called as convexity. Now, what do you mean by convexity? Now, what does duration assume? Duration assumes that if your current rate is 10% and it goes up by 1%, then the bonds price will go down by 3.6%, 3.6%, uh, let us say. If it goes up by 2%, then the bonds price will go down by 7.2%. If it goes up by 3%, the bonds price will go down by, uh, uh, let's say, 10.8% and so on. So it assumes a linear change. It says that for every 1% change in interest rate, the bonds price will fall by 3.6%. Uh, However, if you have some understanding about bonds and if you tr have done sums, where you have tried to find durations at different discount rates. So for a bond, if the duration is 3.6 or 4.1, whatever it is, at a 10% discount rate, if you take 13% discount rate for this same bond and try to find a duration, it will not be exactly 4.1 or 3.6. It will change. So to believe that for every 1% change, the bond price will change by 3.6% is not always correct because as the interest rate changes, the duration also undergoes a change. And that change in duration is what is called as convexity. Uh, uh, convexity, to be honest, demands a separate lecture because of the complex na nature. But if I were to simplify that for your basic understanding, the change in the duration because interest rates change, duration will also change and hence if you presume that for every 1% change, the bond price is going to change exactly by 3.6 is not going to happen. In fact, if I kind of plot this, duration month is that if the market interest rate changes, <coughs> if the market interest rate, let us say, falls, the bond price will increase. If the market interest rate increases, the bond price will fall. 
uh, we predict the linear change a straight line however the change will not be linear it will be in the form of a curve and the curve will be convex in origin and hence there is something called as convexity so this is i mean loosely explaining though i can understand that convexity demands a separate lecture altogether but <coughs> this is what is convexity it is the rate at which the duration changes the rate at which the duration would change due to changes in the ytm uh, okay now how do you calculate convexity convexity is calculated as over here v plus v minus minus 2 v0 upon 2 v0 into delta or change in ytm squared abhi ye samajhna thoda mushkil hai what i'm trying to say is ideally if you were at 100 rupees today if your value today v0 was 100 and if the changes were exact if the lower value for example if there's a one percent change then the lower value is let's say minus 3.6 so this is 96.4 and the higher value is exactly 3.6 which is 103.6 then if i take the numerator 103.6 plus 96.4 minus 2 into 100 aapko numerator mein necessarily zero hi aega if the changes are exactly 3.6 percent your numerator will always give you a zero however if you sit and calculate no at 11 percent and 10 percent yahan pe thoda difference aayega for example this might be for example loosely speaking this is 104 whereas for example this might be 97 and hence in such a case this will be 104 plus 97 minus 2 into 100 and hence that difference is that is arising in the numerator is due to the convexity so uh, v minus is the lower value v plus is a higher value on let us say a one percent or a two percent change in interest rate and in the denominator you take ytm squared largely because uh, well this is uh, when you look at duration you take ytm only here you take ytm squared because duration is i mean if you look at derivatives it is the first derivative of uh, change in interest rate if interest rate changes price changes bang so that is interest rate ka change impact on price now as the interest rate changes duration also undergoes a change and hence the change in the duration is measured by convexity to iske liye usko square karte hai logic hai though ye samajhna thoda mushkil hai and it has just come once in your exam so convexity is not as important though in this section i would rate the duration as well as maxwell as duration to be very important so bond valuation being important yield to maturity being important and duration being important till now now if you understand the concepts uh, till now then you can be building bond strategies and this is the litmus test of your understanding of bonds so if you are able to develop a bond strategy you have understood bonds otherwise you have not understood bonds you have got the marks but you will not understand bonds what do you mean by bond strategies well bond strategies in response to changes in yield so if as a bond manager if you have a portfolio of bonds let's say there is a government of india bond of 2006 a government of india bond of 2010 a government of india bond of yes sir, some of the study material mein hai, and hence i'm discussing this uh, I, I mean i can take another example as well so this is 32 there are various bonds and they have various different durations so this is a five duration this is let's say a seven duration this is a 13 duration and this is let us say 20 duration for example now if if as a bond manager my perception is that uh, market may be inflation bahut bad right? and if the inflation is increasing the bond uh, or, or, or let us say hypothetically uh, let's go the other way around it's easier to understand if inflation is falling i believe that okay if at a lower inflation rbi will reduce the interest rates if interest rates reduce bond price increases so my expectation is interest rate delta is a change in interest rate interest rates are going to fall in which case bond prices are going to rise here i've taken only four securities in practice there are more than 400 securities which may be there on your screen which is the bond that you should buy if your expectation is that the interest rates will reduce they have not yet reduced but this is your expectation that they will reduce if they will reduce well you should say that the bond prices will rise and which bonds will rise the most well the bonds which uh, uh, which have the longest duration so the bonds with the longest duration will rise the most and as a result you will take a strategy of buying the longer duration bonds 
So you will buy the longer duration bonds and if you don't have the money, you will sell some shorter duration bonds which will increase only by 5% roughly and use that money to buy a longer duration bond which will potentially increase by 20%. On the other hand, what is happening now is the inflation is increasing. So we are expecting RBI to increase interest rates and hence the market interest rates will go up. If the market interest rates go up, bond prices will go down and if bond prices go down, uh, which bonds should you buy or which bond should you sell well bond prices are going down so ideally you will sell the bonds which are expected to go down the maximum that is a longer duration bonds you will try to sell and if you are a bond investor if you have to invest in bonds you sell the longer duration bonds cut out your losses and probably put your money in the shorter duration bonds so you will buy the shorter duration bonds in case interest rates are expected to rise take some time pause the video and try to ponder upon this because bond strategies is the litmus test of your understanding. If you have understood duration, understood the relationship between interest and price, you should be able to build a bond strategy. Aja, there are a few questions that are also there on bond refinancing and they also come in the exam. Uh, what do you mean by bond refinancing? It means that there is an existing bond which you have already issued, but that was issued a few years back at a higher interest rate, for example, at 14%. Now you see that the market interest rates have fallen. They have fallen to around 8 or 9%. And hence, um, you are now thinking that should I, uh, uh, should I repay the existing bond, but you don't have the money. So what you can actually do is you can raise money through a new bond at the lower rate, that is 8 or 9% and repay the older bond. Well, that appears to be a clear win-win strategy. However, you need to think about the cause that will go behind this transaction. For example, uh, uh, there may be a premium on early repayment of the older bond which has to be considered. There may be flotation costs which are linked to the new bond which also have to be considered. And there are there is also a tax aspect. So it is possible that uh, 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 you get tax savings on interest. The older bond had a higher interest but then it also has a higher tax savings. The lower bond has a lower interest but it also has a lower tax savings. Flotation cost will also result in certain tax savings. So all of these factors have to be considered and considering all of them, we need to decide whether it is advisable to refinance a bond or not. It's like a capital budgeting evaluation. In almost all cases, discount rate is given, but if it is not given, then you can calculate it as uh, the market rate, rate of interest uh, into 1 minus t, like the cost of debt can be taken as the discount rate for this evaluation, but ideally it should be given. So we will compare for the old and the new bond after considering the tax impact, the interest which will be lower for the new bond, call premium that is the early repayment premium that needs to be paid and flotation costs etc along with their corresponding tax savings. And the last concept is on immunization. Now immunization as it means is very helpful for managers which have asset and liability management. So for example, a, 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 a bank or a provident fund or a pension fund which has to pay liabilities. So it has liabilities uh, which need to be paid which are also exposed to interest rate and in order to meet those liabilities I might have made some investments in let us say bond portfolios which are also exposed to interest rate changes. So over here I am a fund manager who has liabilities which are also affected by interest rate changes and bond assets which are also affected by interest rate changes. So uh, how do I protect myself from this interest rate movement? Well immunization is a strategy which says that if the duration of the assets is equal to the duration of the liabilities that is when the bond portfolio is considered to be immunized that is it is considered to be immune from interest rate changes. Sir how will we know that immunization has to be done? Question would have given you the duration of liabilities. It says that for example, there's a fund manager who has a liability due after six years and wants to hold an immunized portfolio. Aja, if the manager wants to hold an immunized portfolio and if the duration of the liability is six, he has to construct a portfolio with the assets duration also being six. If there are multiple bonds, then we have to calculate the portfolio duration, which is calculated as a weighted average duration with the amounts invested in each bonds being taken as weights. So duration of portfolio investment of assets should equal the duration of liabilities for the bond to be immunized and if it is immunized the interest rate risk uh, on this bond is considered to be minimum. So that takes care of bonds and then we go to equities. So next we go to the valuation of equity shares. So this is the second part of this chapter where we try to find the value that one should pay for an equity share. 
Now, ideally, the value of a share, like the value of a bond, should be based on the present value of the future cash flows. Now, we have done this for bonds, so ideally, that same logic should even apply for shares. So, when we look at bonds, the value of a bond is the present value of its future interest and principal payments. In equity, you don't have a principal payment, but in equity, you do have dividends. But the problem in equity vis a vis the bond is the equity shares give you cash flows up to perpetuity because unless given otherwise a company is assumed to have a perpetual existence and as a result these dividends can theoretically continue up to perpetuity now you can do a valuation for 5 10 15 30 40 50 100 years but up to perpetuity will be a slightly challenging process and as a result we take the help of mathematical models uh, of geometric progression and uh, summation of perpetual GPs, etc. We are not doing the derivations, etc. But that is what Myron Gordon has done in his Gordon's formula. So, Gordon says that the value of a share is the present value of all the future dividends, and these are dividends which continue up to perpetuity. So, the present value of D1, D2, D3, go, so on up to perpetuity. Gordon just makes one golden assumption. Gordon says that the growth rate has to remain constant. And if the growth rate is to remain constant, then this entire formula kind of simplifies into D1 by Ke minus G, where D1 is the dividend of the coming year. Ke is the cost of equity and G is the growth rate. Now, how do you calculate the growth rate? Growth rate is calculated as R into B, where R is like the return on retained earnings or investments. We can say that this is similar to the ROE, return on equity, whereas B is the retention ratio. So, the way in which you can grow is you can kind of try to improve your efficiency and have a higher ROE or you can retain more so that more capital is available for growth. So this is how you calculate growth for KE. There are various methods that you must have studied in your inter CA. First is the method as per CAPM. RF plus RM minus RF into beta. If not, then typically we use the Gordon's formula, but here we are doing the Gordon's formula. So it is not as uh, relevant. And third, you look at the earnings yield. So over here in earnings yield method, you calculate earnings upon price. So this is a method where we do E upon price to find the cost of capital. Sometimes you can even uh, take this as inverse of the PE ratio. So if you have one upon P by E, so that is the inverse of the PE ratio can also be taken. And then there is the dividend yield where you take dividend by price. So these are the four methods in which KE can be calculated. Uh, so in the single stage, what do you mean by single stage? A single stage growth means that the G from year one all the way up to perpetuity, the growth rate in percentage remains the same, in which case P0 equals D1 by Ke minus G. The multi-stage formula is a much more common formula that is applied for a share valuation because it is slightly unreasonable to believe that the dividend grows equally for each of the years. Having said that, it is fairly difficult to find different values up to perpetuity. So in the foreseeable future, let us say three to five years, we will try to predict the dividend. And let us say the dividend, which is predicted in year one, two, three, and four, for example, is uh, 10, then 12.5, then 15, uh, then let us say, uh, or let's say 14 and then let's say 18. So these are growing at different rates. But then after year four, that is from year five up to perpetuity, the growth rate is constant. Then what do you do? Well, you can't apply the Gordon's formula. So what you can do is you can take a blended method where you will try to find the present value of the future cash flows and the discounting factor over here. For example, the cost of capital, let us say is 10%. So we will say that the value of a share is the present value of all future dividends that is year one, year two, year three, year four, which we have taken. And from year five up to perpetuity, you will have, let's say 18, let's say 5% is a growth rate into 1.05 upon 0 0.10 Ke minus 0 0.05. So this is the Gordon's formula that you are applying. So you are applying the Gordon's formula that is D5 upon Ke minus G. But remember, when you calculate D5 by Ke minus G, you get P4. Sir, when you take D1 by Ke minus G, you get P0. 
in a similar way if you take d2 by k minus g you should get p1 in a similar way if you are starting with d5 by k minus g you will get p4 and that will be the value at year 4 so over here this is let's say 18 into 1.05 upon 0 0.05 will come to 378 or so and this is the present value so this 378 basically is the present value of d5 up to d perpetuity okay but this is also the value at the end of year 4 and hence you will have to discount them so the value of all of these cash flows year 1 year 2 year 3 year 4 dividends and then it theoretically it is as if if you were to sell the share at the end of year 4 what will you get well at the end of year 4 you should be getting let us say uh, 18 into 1.05 upon 0 0.05 so this should be the value at the end of year 4 and that will be the giving you the value of the share so you will divide this into two parts in the first part you will find the present value of all dividends during the periods of different growth rates and then in the second part once the growth rate stabilizes you will use the Gordon's formula okay so uh, you, you should practice a lot of sums which is on the Gordon's formula it is definitely important especially I would say the multi-stage growth is important from an exam standpoint and then comes the important concept of free cash flows very important Ajay, when we look at free cash flows why do we need free cash flows well the birth of this concept is in the drawback of the Gordon's formula so when we look at the Gordon's formula the Gordon's formula assumes that dividends uh, will be the cash flows however dividends are discretionary free cash flow model says that you should judge a company based on its ability to generate free cash flows and not merely by the dividend it pays it may be the case that there is a company like microsoft we have discussed this probably that has never that had never paid dividend for 20 25 30 years after its incorporation maybe because it wanted to invest money back into more r d and then it made a bumper dividend in the early 2000s does that mean microsoft is a bad company no Dividend is discretionary. You should not judge the uh, judge Microsoft based on its ability or based on the dividend that it pays. You should judge it by the ability to pay dividend. Now, whether it pays dividend or not is irrelevant. But does it have enough dry powder or enough ammunition with it to pay dividend? All else remaining unaffected then it is a successful company. So over here we have the free cash flow model where the focus is on an enterprise's ability to generate free cash flow which could be distributed as dividend now whether you actually distribute it or don't is irrelevant okay so when we look at the free cash flow model you also have to remember two other concepts one is the firm concept and one is the enterprise uh, firm or enterprise concept and second is the equity concept now what do you mean by firm or an enterprise it means the entire business that is if I were to buy a house of 100 or of 10 of 1 crore let us say uh, and I take 80 lakhs of loan and 20 lakhs of my own money then I would say that the assets or the business that I have is worth 1 crore however my own money that is equity is 20 lakhs however the business or the entire assets are worth 1 crore so firm or the enterprise is like all the assets irrespective of whether they are financed by debt or equity or preference whereas equity refers to the value of only the equity component so over here uh, I mean if one goes to see the value of the firm or the enterprise is equal to the value of the equity plus the value of debt as I mean assuming there's no preferences if there's preferences you will also add the value of preferences okay so what is the free cash flow to the firm what is the free cash flow to equity FCFE free cash flow to equity is a pool of money that is available to pay shareholders as I remember shareholders get money after debt holders are paid off and as a result when we calculate FCFE for example we start at PAT so PAT uh, well is PAT a cash flow no PAT is not a cash flow so we want to convert PAT into the cash flow and you should visualize a cash flow statement that you have prepared under AS3 or index 7 under the cash flow statement you start with PAT and you add back all non-cash expenses for example depreciation okay uh, should you also add back interest uh, we are trying to find the free cash flow to equity and equity holders get money after interest and all other uh, stakeholders are paid off so interest should not be added back in FCFE because it is a pool of money which is available to pay the equity shareholders but depreciation and other non-cash expenses like amortizations should be added back because they are non-cash in nature and hence they are not really cash flows 
Okay, so this is PAT plus depreciation or non-cash expenses. Does that give you cash flow? Well, in a way, yes, cash flow from operations. However, when you look at PAT, within PAT, uh, you take sales. Is it necessary that you have collected every rupee from sales? No. You take purchases. Is it necessary that you have paid everything in purchases? No. And as a result, if you visualize the indirect method in the cash flow statement, you have some working capital adjustments. <coughs> Sorry. You have some working capital adjustments whereby what happens is, for example, if theoretically, if your sales are 100 rupees and let us assume there are no expenses, then your profits are going to be 100. However, in your balance sheet, if there are debtors and starting of the year, there were zero debtors at the end of the year, there are 30 rupees worth of debtors. That effectively means that yes, you have sold goods worth 100, but you have not been able to collect money for 30 rupees as yet. And hence the money collected must have been 70. And hence we would say that, okay, PAT is 100, but the cash flows is not. Uh, from that you subtract the increase in debtors. If you remember, you have studied that in cash flow statement as well. And for that logic, we will adjust the working capital changes. So if there's an increase in working capital or current assets, you will subtract. If there's a decrease in working capital, you will add. So over here, when we look at the free cash flows, it is PAT, add back depreciation, less increase in working capital, uh, add decrease in working capital. This will typically give you the cash flow from operations or CFO. However, uh, that is not something which is freely available for distribution and as a result we'll say that well you know what if you want to continue in your business you'll have to replace the assets which wear out you will have to kind of buy new assets for financing growth and as a result you will also have to keep aside money for replacing assets and hence less increase in net fixed assets and if you are selling assets then you have the money then decrease in net fixed assets typically it will be increase Okay, so that is very similar to your cash flow from investing. However, uh, does that mean that the money now is freely available? No, because you still have to pay uh, the debt holders. And hence, if there is borrowings or preference shares to be repaid, uh, that is a cash outflow, which is typically cash flow from financing. However, if borrowings are taken or preference shares are issued, that will add to the cash available sir why are we even taking that because ideally it is possible that let's say during the year you have to buy new fixed assets worth 100 but does that 100 essentially come from equity money only no you might be taking new loans worth 80 for that and hence net 20 comes in from equity money so you will have to adjust that borrowings taken or borrowings repaid as well so that will give you the free cash flow to equity and remember the free cash flow to equity belongs to equity. So if I want to find the value of equity, value of equity will be free cash flow to the equity for uh, year one divided by KE minus G. That will give you the value of equity because free cash flow to equity belongs to the equity. And hence it the relevant discount rate should be the cost of equity. By that same logic, if somehow we can try to find a free cash flow to the firm, which is a pool of money, which is available to pay debt and equity both. It is a pool of money, which is available to pay all long term providers of capital, debt and equity, and even preference shares. Then that should be so free cash flow to the firm. If we discount and how we calculate, we'll see, but the relevant discount rate should be the WACC because that is the required rate of return for debt and equity both minus Z. What that will give you is the value of the firm, sir. Why? Well, if you are taking the uh, free cash flow to the firm, that is the pool of money which is available for debt and equity both, then the discounting rate should also be the discounting rate which is relevant for debt and equity both. So that is the WACC and you get the value of firm. If you want to wind the value of equity, value of firm minus the value of debt will give you the value of equity. Okay, sir, but how do we calculate the free cash flow to the firm? Well, you can take the free cash flow to equity as a base. That is, we'll start with PAT. Is a PAT the pool of money available to pay debt and equity both? No. PAT is the pool of money which one can loosely say is available for equity but not for debt. And as a result, you will have to add back interest. And if there's any preference dividend, preference dividend as well. So if I'm trying to find a pool of money which is available for debt and equity both, that is the earnings before interest, before preference dividend. Achha, but if I'm not considering interest, then ideally I should not even consider the tax savings, if any, that I get on interest. And as a result, what I add back is interest into 1 minus T, that is net of tax. Preference dividend does not typically give you any tax savings and hence we don't really make any separate tax saving adjustment there. But nevertheless, over here, 
the new adjustment over here will be PAT same as FCFE, depreciation same uh, non-cash in nature. However, interest and preference dividend will be added back because PAT is calculated after that. We are trying to find the pool of money for debt and equity both and hence we add back interest. Achha. Similarly, we want to find the cash flow. So we will subtract the increase or decrease in working capital and we want to find the free cash flow. That is after keeping aside money for fixed assets and hence we subtract the fixed assets as well. We do not subtract the borrowings etc. Because over here, this is the pool of money for the enterprise. The debt holders are treated like owners over here. The firm uh, belongs to debt and equity both. And hence, the amount to be paid to the debt is not a cost. It's very similar to an appropriation and as a result, we don't consider them separately. Okay, so this is the logic that goes behind the free cash flow model, which is an important model. Uh, so this uh, is what I guess is important, especially multi-stage free cash flow, the most important uh, in the equity section. There are a few other alternative valuation models out of for which few one or two, one or two illustrations are there in your uh, study material, which is the earnings yield model or earnings growth model. Now this is calculated in exactly the same way. These are not important. I would say the decentral section is not as important, but nevertheless, it is good to know. You should be aware. Uh, earnings growth model is same as the dividend growth model just that instead of dividend you take the earnings over here so over here this will be uh, uh, e1 by ke minus g this is e1 by ke minus g the pe multiple approach over here will take uh, eps into pe but the pe over here will be the implied pe and the implied pe is calculated by 1 plus the cost of equity so this is how you calculate implied pe ratio EPS into the implied PE ratio will give you the price in both of these methods in that one or two sums that are there in the study material they assume R is equal to KE that is the actual rate of return that a company earns is equal to the required rate of return. This is not always correct but uh, for these two methods institute has done it that way so we will stick to that. Next you have the yield method there is just one sum over here on these lines where you calculate the actual yield in percentage divided by the expected or normal yield for the industry in percentage into the paid up value. So over here, if you remember, there is this question where uh, you have been told that yield for a company is calculated as 50% uh, uh, of the uh, distributed profits and 5% of undistributed profits. That is the measure that a particular industry uses. So we said that, okay, how much is the actual yield percentage for you as compared to how much is the adjusted actual uh, percentage for the industry? So for example, if you are earning 15%, whereas the industry is earning 10%, then you are at a premium vis-a-vis -vis the industry. And hence, if your paid up value is rupees 10, ideally you should be trading at a premium. So probably over here, it will be 15% by 10% into let us say rupees 10 uh, will give you the price. Walter's model, you must have studied this in your inter CA in dividend, not as important, but nevertheless, in case it comes up is it's more of a model which guides you on the dividend policy than the share valuation but just in case it lands up so this is uh, p0 equals d upon r by ke into e minus d upon ke so you are taking the dividend plus r by ke into the retained earnings uh, into uh, the entire term upon the ke and the last is the post issue market price approach where you might be given certain data that okay this is a current market cap after which you might do a fresh issue so your total uh, funds available increases then those funds may be deployed in certain projects so npvs etc might be given and somehow you can try to find a post issue market capitalization divide that by the post issue number of shares and that will give you the price per share so there might be an issue and after issue uh, you might be asked to calculate the price per share so you will try to find the post issue market capitalization divided by the post issue number of shares these are five methods which are there uh, i mean but i don't really think any of them are important from an exam standpoint Achha. then there is some theory on what you call as efficient market hypothesis uh, given by uh, someone called as eugene farmer so what is efficient market hypothesis there are three types of markets which have been broadly outlined first is a weak form of efficient market hypothesis semi-strong form and the strong form in the weak form of efficient market hypothesis uh, the people in the market are able to absorb the information about the past price and volume movements into the current price so 
the effect of the past price and volume movements would be there in the price like what technical analysis do that is there in the price uh, but the effect of forward future information or future growth prospects of the company are not as well considered the market is not as developed when you look at the semi strong form apart from the past price and volume data like technical analyst jo dekhte hai you also consider the publicly available information so for example if a company announces that it has got an order for let us say uh, manufacturing 10000 uh, electrical vehicles the moment it does the press release the price increases decreases as a case may be so people are able to digest the publicly available information and quantify its impact on the stock price it's a slightly more efficient uh, or a developed market and the last case is the strong form so this largely uh, occurs in theory only where people are so uh, uh, advanced and developed that they are able to factor in the information which is on past price and volume the public the impact of the publicly disclosed information as well as information which has not yet been disclosed that does not mean you do insider trading but it kind of means that uh, you your analyst or the investment fraternity is so uh, kind of uh, uh, advanced that they can project that okay this is how a company is going to grow this is how their earnings are going to uh, improve and that actually translates so it is like perfect competition jo theory mein exist karta hai there's no one in the strong form as of now acha in the weak form there are two complex statistical questions again uh, we are not really discussing that statistical calculation here but this is something that i would recommend that you go through like the runs test where you have the number of runs if you are aware you try to find the number of positive sign changes number of negative sign changes the sign differences based on that find the mu and standard deviation and try to find a range so that is a runs test unfortunately the way it is if you understand the rational behind it excellent if not this there's one particular sum wo sum ab dekh lo wo method ab yaad rakho and proceed then there is auto correlation which has come once in the exam i don't think runs test has separately come but auto correlation has come in i think jan 21 question 1a auto correlation with all due respect is not something which is new auto correlation is nothing but correlation of a particular share with its own self so if you know portfolio management and you know how to calculate correlation you know by default how to calculate auto correlation so nahi samajh mein aa raha in your chapter on portfolio management do you know how to calculate the correlation between share x and share y yes sir if there are five observations we know uh, how to calculate correlation that is we take the covariance divided by the variance of x upon the variance of y uh, upon the standard deviation of x into the standard deviation of y so over here rather than two securities you have just one security let us say there is a 20 day time period and in the 20 day time period we assume that the first 10 days of price movement is security x and the next 10 days of price movement is security y in which case you segregate that data and try to find the correlation between the first set of data that is similar to security x first 10 days and the next set of data that is similar to security y for uh, the next 10 days and try to find the correlation if the correlation is very low uh, close to 0 0.1 etc we say that that means the first 10 days and the next 10 days are not correlated so over here uh, one can say that you can't study the past 10 days and try to figure out what is going to happen in the next 10 days no weak form efficient market does not really work because uh, you can't really figure out ke pehle de, de, 10 din mein jo hua uske basis pe you cannot figure out what is going to happen in the next 10 days however if the correlation is very high Uh, more than 0.4 0.5 0.6 0.7 positive or negative you can then based on the 10 days data try to figure out what is going to happen in the next 10 days because the first 10 days and the next 10 days are correlated so in such a case the market exhibits the weak form of efficient market hypothesis one can say that uh, looking at the past data we can kind of figure out what is going to happen in the future acha so that is efficient market hypothesis then there is some a lot of theory on technical analysis i'm not discussing the theory there are various methods a candlestick approach uh, support and resistance levels etc there are a lot of uh, terms though institute does not really have enough sums except for one concept which is on exponential moving average where the institute has a full fledged question so these are the three 
statistical questions that I would recommend you study. One is on runs test, one is on autocorrelation from the Jan 21 paper and one is exponential moving average which has also come in uh, the past. So, these three as it is upward low. Uh, institute of question I am 100% sure wo ye questions will be in the almost the same format. They will not twist and turn this. They will ask it if they ask in the direct way. So exponential moving average. What is technical analysis? Technical analysis looks at the past prices, volumes, etc. And uh, it uh, tries to figure out the price. It does not look at the growth rates, the dividend, cost of equity. No, it looks at past price and volume data to kind of estimate the future prices. Uh, one of the methods to apply technical analysis exponential moving average it is one of the methods a uh, moving average is nothing but an average which moves so the data series uh, I mean if it's a 30 day average then the moment the 31st day happens the first day moves out the 32nd day happens the second day moves out something similar to that so there are a few steps for exponential moving average that you need to remember first is you have to make an exponent adjustment which is based on the current day price less the exponential moving average of the previous day into an exponent factor which has to be given to in the question. So you will take the current day's actual price, compare it with the last day's average and uh, uh, multiply it by the exponent factor. Uh, the current day's exponential moving average will be the uh, moving average of the previous day plus or minus the value that you get in step one and uh, that is how you will keep on doing. The starting point can be taken as the simple moving average of the last 30 days or so. Typically, if the exponential moving average moves up, uh, it shows a bullish trend. If it moves down, it shows a bearish trend. Okay. Then you have the valuation of rights. Now you are going into specific special cases that is rights, buyback, convertibles. When you have rights, there are two types, two concepts based on which a question can come. One is calculation of the theoretical X rights price. How or the post rights price? How do you calculate it? Well, typically you will take the post rights investment in the numerator divided by the post rights number of shares. For example, if the current price before the rights is 150, the rights issue price is 100 and the rights ratio is 1 is to 4, then one can say that I need to have 4 shares which I can buy at 150 and then buy 1 share at 100. So my total investment would be let us say 700 rupees for getting 4 plus 1 that is 5 shares and hence my theoretical X rights price which is the average price would be 140. So this gives you the price excluding the effect of the rights that is the price prevailing after the rights issue which is calculated by this formula given over here and then is the value of the rights alone. How do you value the rights alone that is if I were to renounce the rights how much would someone pay? Well, uh, maximum someone should ideally pay uh, 140 minus 100 in this example, that is 40. Sir, why? Because if, uh, if one says that the discount is 50 rupees, that is wrong because when a buyer buys these rights entitlement, he subscribes to the rights by paying 100 rupees. And by the time the right shares hit the DMAT account, by that time the price would have fallen to 140 rupees and hence the maximum price that the person should pay for getting this rights entitlement should be 40 rupees. So over here, this is calculated as the X rights price minus the rights issue price refers to the maximum price that an investor would be willing to pay for getting the rights entitlement alone. So if, uh, if I were to renounce the rights to someone, how much should I expect to receive? This is around 40 rupees. Aja, then is buyback. Now, why does a company do a buyback like TCS is in the process of doing the buyback. Uh, so why does a company do a buyback? Probably it, if it has surplus cash. So it is one of a good use for surplus cash at the same time um, uh, it sends a positive signal to the market that the management believes that uh, the share is fairly valued or undervalued and that is why management is actually sticking its neck out and buying back shares. Or maybe promoter uh, ka stake up ko percentage consolidate karna hai, or increase karna hai, whatever be the reason. The typical type of questions that can come over here is to find the post buyback price or the post buyback EPS. Now post buyback EPS if you have to calculate, typically buyback is out of surplus funds and hence typically because it is out of surplus funds, yes the company will spend money. So one can always say that okay if your capital reduces then your earning capacity also reduces. Yes, it does provided if I'm a coaching institute and I have 10 classrooms, if I have to sell two of my classrooms to 
fund the buyback yes my earning capacity will fall however if buyback is happening out of my surplus funds so yes i have my 10 class rooms and i do have some surplus funds and i'm use, utilizing those surplus funds to do the buyback in which case uh, largely my earning capacity will not get impacted and hence the post buyback pat which is usually the same unless otherwise given divided by the post buyback number of shares which will be lower so if there are 10 lakh shares and 2 lakh shares have been bought back then there are only 8 lakh shares post buyback this would generally uh, i mean post buyback shares would be lower the eps would generally be higher to be very clear we are trying to say eps would generally be higher and because eps is higher the post buyback market price will typically be higher which is calculated as a post buyback eps into the post buyback PE ratio. So the post buyback EPS into the post buyback PE ratio. Uh, uh, so the post buyback market price would generally be higher. Okay. Next, this is something which I would rate as important from buyback rights and convertibles. Convertibles is something which has been an institute favorite. They end up invariably asking five or eight mark uh, questions on convertibles where they give various terms like conversion value. What is conversion value? Well, in case of a convertible, if I were to convert this into equity share, then what is the value? So for example, one convertible bond converts into 10 shares. Okay, so one bond converts into 10 shares and each share today is worth 115 uh, rupees. Then 150 is my conversion value. That is if I were to convert this bond today into equity shares, that will give me 150. On the other hand, straight value. What do you mean by straight value? As the name goes, this value is uh, uh, if this bond were to remain as it is straight like it is a bond it does not go left and right does not become a share then what is the value well the value of such a bond is the present value of all the future interest and principal payments so this is nothing but the present value of all future coupons and present value of redemption values so for example the coupons for these bonds are let us say 10 rupees into let's say 3.791 it's a five-year bond plus the redemption value is 100 into 0.621 let us say for simplicity this is 100 rupees agar upon total kare i'm just taking a random numbers scheme so over here uh, the i mean if i it makes sense converting because over here if i were to convert this bond uh, i'll get 150 versus uh, i mean keeping the bond as it is however uh, one can say that maybe i will wait for the conversion or whatever be the reasons i might not really convert so sometimes there is a market price of this bond which is let us say 165 or 180 rupees the market price for a convertible bond sir why is it 180 well we don't know probably it is because this bond gives you a choice it gives you that support that collude if things go bad equity shares 150 is a zero bhi ho sakta hai. but bond to abhi bhi value intact rahega and hence you are kind of paying some premium so there is some conversion premium which can be calculated as the market price of the convertible bond minus the conversion value which is let's say 150 so over here the conversion premium is 30 you can also calculate this premium in percentage per share or whatever it is or as a ratio this is the excess that you are paying over the conversion value conversion premium downside risk what do you mean by downside risk it means that if equity shares become worthless then how much loss will you suffer well if i were to buy the bond i'll spend 180 and if equity shares suffer uh, becomes worthless still it is going to remain as a bond and as a result my downside is 80 rupees again you can calculate it as a percentage as well so this is the downside risk uh, or the premium over the straight value then there is conversion parity price what does this mean it means that uh, i'm buying the share indirectly so i'm paying 180 rupees which gives me access to one bond through which I can buy 10 shares, which means 180 by 10, that is 18 rupees is effectively what I'm paying for per share. So this is the market price of the bond, that is 180 upon the conversion ratio, that is 10 shares per bond. So 18 is what I'm effectively paying as compared to the share which is available in the market at 15. Income differential means uh, how much extra income am I getting by holding this as a bond vis-a-vis -vis holding this as a share so if i were to buy a bond i will get interest but if i don't buy a bond and i go and directly buy shares then i'm going to get dividend let us say the dividend per uh, uh, per share is 50 paise for example in which case one can say that what is the annual interest this is 100 into 10 percent that is equal to 10 rupees is the annual interest per bond however uh, if i were to 
by equivalent number of shares well one bond has equivalent 10 shares then 10 into 0 0.5 that is equal to 5 rupees will be my equivalent dividend and as a result if i were to buy the bond and hold the bond i will get 5 rupees more as compared to buying a share and earning the dividend this working really helps you in finding the payback one can say that well you are uh, uh, you uh, so this is wrong i think premium payback period equals conversion premium conversion premium upon income differential so when we look at the conversion premium the conversion premium let us say is 30 rupees and the income differential is 5 so we are saying that okay on one hand we are paying 30 rupees extra for this bond but then each year we are going to get 5 5 rupees extra income interest humko 10 milta hai as opposed to dividend of 5 and hence it will take 6 years for us to recover the premium without considering time value so this is the premium payback period these are the usual terms the institute can also ask you some other terms but these are the typical terms that they prefer asking and the last part which is uh, a, a, a recent addition in your uh, syllabus which was there in the old old course but from may 21 this has also been added which is on money market instruments money market instruments are nothing but bonds but which are short term so typically when government issues long term bonds they are called as government securities but if they are less than one year so it's a 14 day or uh, 28 days or 61 days or 91 days these are typically called as treasury bills if government issues these are treasury bills sometimes this has been issued by the companies like for example reliance industry Tata motors issues these are called as commercial papers again short term instruments if banks issue like hdfc bank icici to another bank they can be called as certificates of deposits uh, and if money is for a very short term period i mean you need it for around six seven eight days only then there is a call market uh, or uh, notice money market for one to around 14 days very short term for example you have to pay advance tax you don't have money right now money is going to come by around 20th of March so you can go to the call money market call money just barely for five days uh, these are money market instruments uh, short term less than one year money market has been popularized by the scam 1992 if you've seen mape money market ka bhot charcha ho rai, but nevertheless money market instruments are uh, these instruments there's also repo or reverse repo repo refers to repurchase so uh, in in these instruments it might happen that you are selling a security and then agreeing to buy back at a particular price after considering the interest so rather than you uh, uh, entering into a separate loan agreement giving a particular investment as security you are telling the buyer you take the share, take this bond and i will buy back the bond at whatever is the price plus the interest agreed in most of these questions involving uh, money market instruments the institute asks you to calculate what is called as the annualized yield or bond equivalent yield this is calculated in simple terms where these instruments are typically issued at a discount abhi ek saal ke niche ka instrument hai usme har ek jan ka apan record rakhe gaye we have to give uh, coupons and all of this uh, they say forget it we will not give you a coupon but we will issue the instrument at a discount so for example there is an instrument whose issue price is 970 whose face value is for example 1000 and the term is for example 3 months in which case we would say that what is the return there is no coupon for these instruments so 1000 minus 970 that is 30 is the return on an investment of 970 into 100 so this is a return but this is a return for three months so into 12 by 3 will give you the percentage per annum so this is thousand so this is 30 upon 970 into 100 into uh, let's say this is around 12.37 percent so what oh, you are doing over here is you're trying to find the bond equivalent yield the bond yields are typically in a percentage per annum terms or the annual return in simplified terms However, this is not the effective return. If I want to find the effective rate of interest, here we are assuming that, okay, uh, agar aap sif itna dekho, so this is 30 upon 970, that's around 3.09. So you're saying 3.09 in the first quarter, again 3.09, again 3.09, again 3.09, total karege to around 12.36 or 37 aata. However, that 3.09 might kind of compound and as a result, if you want to find the effective yield, it can also be calculated as 1 plus uh, uh, 
पॉइंट वन टू थ्री सेवन अपॉन फोर रेस टू फोर आई मीन इट इज गोइंग टू बी कंपाउंडेड फोर टाइम्स इन अयर बिकॉज तीन महीने के अंदर पैसा आएगा अपन वापस इन्वेस्ट करेंगे बट टेक्निकली स्पीकिंग यू आर नॉट गोइंग टू इन्वेस्ट नाइन सेवेंटी अगेन यू आर एक्चुअली गोइंग टू इन्वेस्ट थाउजेंड देन अगेन यू आर गोइंग टू गेट मोर देन मोर सो द रिटर्न विल बी स्लाइटली हायर एंड दैट इज द इफेक्टिव एनुअल रिटर्न सो दिस इज द टाइप ऑफ क्वेश्चन दैट कम फॉर ट्रेजरी बिल्स कमर्शियल पेपर सर्टिफिकेट ऑफ डिपॉजिट फॉर रेपो रेवर सेपो इट्स स्लाइटली डिफरेंट क्वेश्चन वेर यू माइट नीड टू कैलकुलेट द रीपर्चेज प्राइस आफ्टर कंसिडरिंग द इंटरेस्ट अग्रीड एंड द इंटरेस्ट ऑन द बॉन्ड but this is the type of questions which will come for money market okay so i guess uh, that should take care of uh, this discussion i hope this lecture has been helpful in terms of important topics from this chapter i would rate uh, uh, in bonds i would rate the bond valuation the in the return section the yield to maturity then the duration these are important topics within bonds within equity shares you will have multi stage gordons model and multi stage free cash flow both of them being important and then convertibles being slightly important so this is what i would rate as important having said that it's a very wide and an interesting topic i hope uh, you have enjoyed this and um, wish you all the very best and we'll see you soon with more such videos if you like the video uh, or if you have enjoyed the content please do uh, like the video and subscribe also press the bell button if you want notifications thank you very much this is babik choksi signing off and i'll see you soon bye bye take care